The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Mario Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendricks. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. Oh, man. Episode 271 coming at you. You feeling that new intro, folks? Are you feeling that new intro? I'm changing things up here. We've already gone through 1,000 episodes. Well, I've at least gone through 1,000 episodes, so I'm going to mix things up here. I'm going to try a variety of things. I kind of like this right now, this little uh, this little metal attack, metal anthem type of thing. I like the harder rock and music. I know some of you may not be into that type of thing, but uh, I kind of do. We're kicking off the next uh, next era of my podcast career, in case you're wondering. We're at 1,001 all-time show. Actually, you know what? I probably, yeah. Actually, I don't know. I, th- this was so many shows that we're putting out on the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It's going to be hard to keep count. That's why I keep track of these things with an episode log. Anyway, Frank Trigg was on Bonus Points. Check that out. Uh, we haven't even told you who's on our show yet today, or my show today, but uh, Richard Immel had Frank Trigg on the Bonus Points Podcast. Check that out at themat.com and also at matttalkonline.com. Today, for the fourth time, Chael Sonnen of MMA fame, a Greco-Roman uh, I guess specialist in his international day, all American at the University of Oregon. Of course, uh, the guy did pretty good for himself in the UFC. He's got a big event coming up in Portland on July 17th. It's called Submission Underground. We'll be talking to him later in the program about that. But before we get started, some of you know this, and I'm pretty prolific, I guess it would say, on social media, even though as I get into my later 30s, I'm 36 years old, about to turn 37. I- I'm-, I'm boring now. I'm I'm no longer posting random stuff. I mean, my buddy Nate Shy can post stuff that I wish I could post. And he's married with a kid. He can still get away with it. Me, I I, I don't have that luxury. I can't hang in a skybox with him and him and Frost and and, and the pistol and stole and, and Taylor. I can't hang with those guys like I used to uh, on the social media trend because uh, it's just I, there's, there's certain things I, I will lose. That being said, I want to thank everybody who is reached out, whether it be a text message, a direct message on Twitter, a tweet, uh, a Facebook post, a reply to a photos, as I brought in a new member to my family on July 8th, 2016, at exactly 1.40 a.m. in the morning. Ruby Rio Bryant checked in at her weight class of 7 pounds, 11 ounces, 18 and 3 quarter inches, girl number two. And in case you're wondering, yes, there is a theme. My older daughter, Lucy, just turned four. Her name, Lucy London. Now we're going with Ruby Rio. So let's look at all the different things. Of course, we've got the Olympic thing in there. Now, Lucy's name was not originally intended to be based around the Olympics. My wife had spent time abroad in college in London. It's her favorite city on the planet. I was kind of objecting to the name of London as a first name. So we didn't do that. But we kind of like the old school Lucy. And then I like alliteration being a journalist and a writer. So we had Lucy London. So that was pretty simple. And it was also an Olympic year. The name London would have been there had it not been 2012. It definitely would not have been a first name. Now, I'm not trying to piggyback on Terry Brands and Brandon Slay with their they're Olympian children. Both, they both have daughters named Sydney. Not trying to do that. That's not my intent. It's just we happen to share. Uh, my wife and I actually spent some time in London on our way back from South Africa when we were dating. So we've both been there. She spent significant time there. I spent time there uh, with the Olympic Games in 2012. So Lucy London was kind of a, a no brainer. Now, when we get to ours now, here's the story. I we were looking at the Chinese calendar. And you know in wrestling, there are certain times of the year you're not supposed to have children. We're not worried about the Chinese calendar. We're worried about the wrestling calendar. So, couldn't have a child in July. Well, at least mid-July, because that's Fargo. Couldn't have a child in March, because that basically is the entire college wrestling postseason. Typically not in September, because that's the World Championships. Uh, August, usually the Olympics, we have a little bit of leeway with that, because that's every four years. Uh, We're 36 now. Don't think we're going to have to worry about that too much. And then, uh, you know, mid-January, early January for the Virginia Duels. I mean, there's certain things I cannot miss. 
Uh, I missed one major wrestling event for something related to uh, to my child so far since uh, Lucy's been born. And that was, well, actually two, because uh, one on my way to universities is when we had to go to the hospital. But that that's that was four, four years ago, four, yeah, four years and change. But uh, World Team Trials in 2013 fell on my daughter's first birthday. Not going to miss my first birthday. So the only World Team Trials or Olympic Trials I've missed since 2004 has been 2013. So anyway, so that's that's how we work on the calendar. So I'm also looking at the Chinese calendar. Okay, when is the perfect time for people our age to have a boy? Because I am the last in the bloodline. I'm giving you a lot of personal information here. But yeah, I mean, it's just a story because everybody likes talking about kids. Everybody likes talking about their kids. I love talking about my daughter. Now daughters. The little one, I tell you, I'll, I'll mention this later on the, on the broadcast with Chael. The little one, uh, Ruby screams like a velociraptor. I mean, I don't know what it, what it is. I'll explain that a little bit more uh, when we get on to our interview with Chael later in the program. But so anyway, back to the boy. So 24 week ultrasound rolls around and I'm expecting boy because Abby looked up the Chinese calendar and said, hey, Chinese calendar says boy. And I'm like, all right, I'm getting stoked. I've got a list of like 14 different boy names and they've got alliteration. They're not all like BBB with the last name Bryant. I wasn't going to go, you know, Bumba Bumba Bryant. Uh, I was there were some B's in there. My actual my, my older stepsister actually stole my boy name uh, when they had a, a child about four years ago. Uh, at this point, five years ago, yeah, I think Brody. Yeah, Brody would have been my boy name because maybe because I like Jaws. But, you know, Brody Bryant would have been cool, you know, but they had Brody, and that kind of nixed that. So I'm going in this to the ultrasound with my boy names in check. And then about five minutes before the doctor comes in, my wife looks at me and goes, I've got a confession to make. I kind of looked it up again, and the Chinese counter actually says, girl. And then here we go, girl. So then I start thinking, okay, because I know if it was a boy name, the Rio thing would have been totally out. I'm not going to name my son, uh, you know, a rather, you know, it's, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily gender specific. But let's just say I think that's more of a, a girl's name than it would be a boy's name, even if it would be a middle name. Uh, London, I think, can kind of go both ways. I don't know. But so that's the thing. I got the, I got the girl and we're, we're fighting. We're not we don't we're not, we were fighting over anything. We're just trying to get the names. And, you know, I wanted to say, OK, alliteration. And there's only a certain amount of R names we can get. And almost every R name we came up with came up with something. You know, there's somebody we know. Oh, I know this many Rachels. I know that many, you know, Renee's. My our our best friends, uh, my wife's best friend's daughter that's just born. His name is Roxy. So I mean, they've got our names out the wazoo. No pun intended. So we 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 ultimately settle on Ruby. So we've got the Olympic thing. We've got them four years. We got two girls. We've got both have four letters in their name. Both. Second letters of each name is a U. Both last letter of each name is a Y. My wife's name is four letters, ends in a Y. Abby is A-B-B-Y. It's not short for anything. So we got kind of a theme here. So anyway, that's how we decided on Ruby Rio. Oh, I just spent like eight minutes telling you about my child. But anyway, I want like the whole point. Thank you. Because the outpouring, I got a lot of Facebook friends. I got a lot of Twitter followers. Thank you very much. Every single one of you. We had, I, I was counting, I think it's over 950 likes on just my personal Facebook account. Over 250 comments. And then the people that went out and, sent, and went out of their way and sent me text messages. And, you know, here's another, another interesting point is Ruby's going to be tied to wrestling, whether she knows it or not. Not because dear old dad is, is wrestling his career, but Ruby shares a birthday with Jordan Burroughs. Yep. So I just, hey, we got that going for us. That being said, I want to, again, thank you, for every single one of you that reached out. And that's why Short Time has been, I, I got rushed to get that episode with Manny Rivera out last week. This will be the only episode before I get to Fargo. Yes, I am going to Fargo. I'm going a little later than normal. I have it. I've missed one session uh, via travel in 17 years. In my younger years, I missed a couple sessions because of sobriety, but that's 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 another issue entirely. But so, uh, you know, here I am going year 18, going to have the turf mugs loaded up, going to have uh, the podcast kicking off me and Richard Immel are going to do some stuff, maybe from B-dubs, maybe from uh, from Herd and Horns, the new place that Steve Saxland and Todd Fuller opened up. But of course, the turf will be in uh, in its just gloriousness, if that is a word to, to say about that. But I, I've been thanking you because of all the outpouring of support. I also want to thank you for supporting this show, the supporting this network, supporting this network. 
and all the shows that go in it. I realized I just said network twice. The thank you bags for the first batch of our Patreon members are completely shipped. Now there's there's two batches going out. If you got a draft class and you're in that role, you're getting you're getting a set. I'm trying to get the rest of the first batch out before I leave for Fargo on Sunday. So uh, just on a roll here, here are the people that have actually been contributing to this network and its content for the last number of months. They are really uh, a driving force in this program. I thank each and every one of you, Zach Anderson, Benjamin Bean, Al Bevilacqua, Rob Bowman, Scott Brewer, Logan Davis, Tom Devine, Mark DeSalvo, Corey Finneran, Dale Goodman, Troy Heinrich, John Illingworth, Richard Immel, David Kim, Scott Kupik, Philip Merrill, Ken Montoya, Scott Pulitik, John Rubiner, Nathan Shy, Wayne Tamala, Jeff Waters, Rodney Williams, Bob Zerrell. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And our latest member at the Olympian level, uh, latest patron, Andrew Burgoyne, thank you for your continued contribution to this network. This is uh, partially supported by sponsorships. I have some in kind uh, training, uh, in training, trade outs, uh, but primarily it's, it's fan supported. So, uh, speaking of the support, this program gets support from Flips Wrestling and Compound Wrestling. The shirts and the goodie bags that I sent out by Compound Wrestling. I'll have a couple shirts and things with me in Fargo. I'm pretty stoked about them. I, I, you know, got that nice, uh, that that real soft, super soft shirt. I got a couple different designs. So only way to get them is contribute to the network by going to madtalkonline.com slash join the team. That is the, the the best way to get a hold of some of this gear and show that you support on-demand original content. Uh, this is this is me. We have Earl Smith on the network. We have Richard Immel on the network. We have Kyle Klingman in the, in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame and the Dan Gable Museum on the network. And again, those contributions also go to picking up the Hall of Fame Legends series. Right now, I just released one on Bill Harlow a couple days ago. Go to halloffamelegends.org slash Harlow. You can listen to that. He was a 2016 inductee into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame as a distinguished member. So without your support, I can't do this. And I'll be honest with you, with those thousands of, com- almost thousand comments, I'd love to get a buck to pay for diapers from each one of you. That'd be cool. That, that, would, that would contribute to the network because for some reason now with two children, I have to find a cave. I have to build this studio that's soundproof now. I'm going to be making uh, enhancements to my equipment, but uh, eventually that's what's cart before the horse. You know, I've got kids to take care of, Uh, you know, now kids, plural. That's kind of scares the crap out of them, to be honest with you. But uh, that's, that's where we're at. I want to thank you for just listening every week because this, the show has grown since its very initial release in, in September of 2013. My first show, Wrestling 411, and along with Kyle Klingman, in uh, September of 2008. I mean, geez, I think uh, the only podcast in wrestling that's been going longer has been Matt Slammers. Yeah, Matt Slammers. 2006. Yeah, we're going to have them on the show eventually. But uh, if you want to contribute to the network. Another thing, Fargo. The Fargo Almanac, the guide that I put out every year. Actually, this is the second year I've put it out. I've updated it for 2016. Go to matttalkonline.com slash join the team. It's 20 bucks, but I'll say this. I'll give you a little uh, Easter egg. Not an Easter egg, but uh, there is a hidden deal somewhere in the Matt Talk Online daily email newsletter. So if you get the newsletter, matttalkonline.com slash news, you can sign up there for free. You will find a coupon for this almanac. So you can save yourself a few bucks right off the bat from this digital almanac. Now here's the thing, it's digital. It's over two, it's 242 pages right now. And it's updated year each year. I'm not going to charge you each and every single year for just one year of updates and resorting stats. You buy it once, you get lifetime digital updates. How's that sound? 20 bucks or if you can find the coupon code in that newsletter, matttalkonline.com/news. To sign up for the newsletter, matttalkonline.com slash Fargo Guide to get the almanac. That's all I've got for right now. Oh, Fargo's here, 18 years in a row for me. Um, guest today, by the way, Chael Sonnen. Talked about that fourth time. We're going to just roll right into it. So uh, here we go. Thank you for listening to the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. Thanks to our sponsors, Compound Clothing at cmpclothing.com and Flips Wrestling at flipswrestling.com. Also making this possible. You... The patrons, the members of the team at Matt Talk Online at matttalkonline.com slash join the team. Enjoy, folks. Enjoy. And now it's time we get to our guest today making his fourth appearance 
on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, I believe trailing just Richard Immel on terms of multiple appearances on this show. Uh, one of the more, I guess, engaging, entertaining guests this show has ever had. Welcome back to the program, Mr. Chael Sonnen. What's happening, Brian? Just uh, as we were talking before we started, uh, sleep deprived right now, sleep deprived. Uh, newborns really take it out of you. I, I fully agree. I'm about, I went through it once. See, we're even here. Now, you're a few months ahead of me. I'm about to go through it a second time. I get it. I'm glad you're going through it right now. because There's great memories. Even though it makes life tough, the memories are wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I just can't remember my dreams right now, but uh, I know my wife is already a saint. She just basically doesn't sleep during the nights because I can't get the baby to stop crying. Because the last time we had a, we had a child, we didn't bring Lucy home until she was four months old because she had some medical issues. But so we missed that whole crying baby thing for four months. We're like, oh, okay, this wasn't so bad. Day two, we've got Ruby sitting there and she's crying, screaming like a velociraptor. I'm like, what? These are the sounds babies make. I didn't know this. So. Anyway, en- enough about the child rearing. Uh, we've got some topics to discuss, and you know we- we've got to put Chael in a cage here, man, because you've you've got a limited amount of time. You're on the interview s- streak. You've got a lot of things to talk about. Let's just open it up right now. Big event coming to Portland, streaming live on Flow Combat Submission Underground. That is July seventeenth. First of all, what is it? Why did you start it? And w- who's going to be there? All right. Well, yeah. Let's start. So, uh, most importantly, July seventeenth. Submission Underground, you're right. It's live and free for all members of Flow Combat. FlowCombat.com, you sign up. It's just part of the content package. But let's see. What they're going to do is they're, they're going to grapple. They're going to grapple for a submission, and somebody's going to get it. They'll go eight minutes, no points. Go out there, big game of mercy, man. Grab any joint, any manipulation, any chokehold you can. If they can't figure out it, eight minutes, we'll go to a overtime uh, where they will take uh, very favorable positions back and forth on one another until somebody uh, until somebody taps out. It's great rules. It's actually called EBI rules. Eddie Bravo uh, came up with them for the Every- Eddie Bravo Invitational. They're the perfect set of rules. Um, when I was talking with Martin uh, for Rainey, we just said, look, if we're going to do this, let's take the best rules that are already out there. And that's it. When you ask the who, uh, you know, people in wrestling might be happy to hear Stephen Abbas is part of the card. He's going to be taking on uh, a black belt. Stephen Abbas has never done this specifically in competition before. Uh, his opponent, Alex Canders, has. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of our own. One of the greatest, most decorated wrestlers we've ever had. And Abbas taking on a lifelong jujitsu playing, fantastic, phenomenal, the Ben Askren, the funky of the jujitsu world in, uh, in candor. So there's, there's plenty of great matches, but I'll tell you, I'll leave it at that one because I think that's what your listeners uh, might want to see the most. Yeah, and there's one thing from, from a wrestling perspective. When you go through Brazilian jiu-jitsu, mixed martial arts, now into grappling, we're seeing a, a, a little bit of a, a, a swell of support for the revival of catch wrestling. There's been some events thrown out there with that. But when, when you're trying to explain grappling, to the wrestling community. I, I remember in 2007, we had the grappling world team trials alongside the U S world team trials. And it seemed like both factions, the grappling fans are looking over at the wrestling and granted, this is in the ball draw era, the three period era going, what the hell is that? And then you got the wrestling fans looking over at rash guards and board shorts and tattoos going, what the hell is that? So from a wrestling perspective, how do you entice a wrestling fan to check out uh, grappling submission style wrestling? And in this flow combat event, uh, this submission underground, well, I'd say I am one of them. I am a wrestling fan, and, and I love this stuff. I love when the wrestlers step a little outside of their comfort zone. We've even seen some wrestling events. Uh, I remember Mark Perry uh, wrestling in one a year ago where it, it was three three-minute rounds, and it was a freestyle match. It was, it was a little bit goofy, but it just gave me something more to look at. Um, I like that stuff. I like when you take somebody like Abbott. The one thing on Abbott is you, you, you had to be an Abbott fan, because if you were cheering against him, all you were going to be was disappointed for about eight straight years. The guy never got beat. Now you take him a little bit outside of his realm that he hasn't done before. And, uh, and the other side of that is now all of a sudden you've got these jujitsu guys saying they're tougher than the wrestlers. That's what this whole thing gets sparked around. And the wrestlers are going, no, 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 we, we're the most dominant of fighting. We're definitely the most dominant 
at grappling. And, and again, you come back to the submission guys and go, ah, not so fast. If you, if you think that's true, come out here and prove it. And under these rules, they're going to prove it. There's, there's no coin toss. They're going to stay out there until somebody taps. Yeah, we look at, uh, you, you talked about that. Ben Askren's tweet, uh, was it the, the biggest takeaway or something like that, was that, that wrestling is the most dominant uh, mixed martial art. And I think uh, we've seen some copycats uh, file that tweet out there. But as soon as I saw Ben tweeted, I hit the retweet button. I mean, look at the UFC 200 card and just as a, as a whole, wrestling's kind of dominating it. And when you get a card like Submission Underground, when you've got the guys that are wrestlers but are, are into BJJ, I mean, you've got guys with wrestling backgrounds. At what point does somebody stop being a wrestler and become more of a practitioner of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or grappling? I mean, or do we say, all right, once you've wrestled, you're always a wrestler, we're always going to count you, we're always going to root for you? That's 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 the field that I'm in right there. You know, I have I haven't got to do amateur wrestling since 2008, but I that's how I fancy myself. So I would imagine that's how the guys do it. Yeah, once a wrestler, wrestler at heart. I think you're just going to pick your style. But the truth is, the wrestlers had better learn BJJ. I mean, if you want to compete in something like this, uh, you know, or mixed martial arts, you you had better learn it. And and some of the guys that we really look up to were the ones. Uh, to tell me that, to tell us that first. Mark Schultz was really the first great wrestler to go out and get his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Uh, you know, Randy Couture and Dan Henderson, they didn't go as far with the belt systems, but they spent a number of years uh, doing uh, submissions and, and, and Jiu-Jitsu before they would go get in the cage. Look no further than Daniel Cormier. Spends years working on, on, on Jiu-Jitsu. Ben Askren spent years working on it. So, it is really effective. It is really important. You know, Jake Herbert retired from wrestling. Boom. Uh, uh, the Monday after the trials, he was in a jujitsu gym. So I don't know what Jake's got planned, but I, I, I know this, this is in his future. Does he switch that over to MMA? Is he just go and compete and get some workouts? I'm not totally sure, but he's got something in mind. And last thing on the submission underground before we get to some of the topics involving uh, UFC 200, there's a couple of things that aren't necessarily involving the UFC I want to talk about, but uh, I don't really care about the sale, to be honest with you. I, I'm not in, invested in terms of what that means to the fans. I mean, I watch it. That's pretty much the extent of it. But uh, submission underground, we've still got – I mean, is Mola Wall still on the card? we still got ben, uh, Benson Henderson. Mo- we still got uh, – Mola Wall got hurt. Okay, so Mo- Mo's Mo's out. got hurt. Hurt his neck. Well, he didn't pull out. I got it. I, now, so here's the thing. Mo refuses to pull out. I guess he's known for his reliability, and uh, and he wants to keep that intact. I found out his neck was hurt, contacted him. He confirmed it was hurt. I pulled him off, uh, and to which he threw a fit and said, I've never pulled off. I'm not going to pull off. I said, Mo, you haven't trained in two months. I, I'm out in Las Vegas. I just talked to your coach, Lavario. Uh, I know you're hurt, man. And uh, so we pulled him off, and, and he will be on the next one. And you st- we still got uh, Kenny Florian and Little Evil? Oh, yeah. We got these guys going out. Uh, here's one you might love, Rico Rodriguez. Do you remember Rico Rodriguez? He's the one that, that beat and took the UFC championship from Randy Couture back in the day. Rico Rodriguez has been in retirement. We found him. He's back. He's in great shape. He's a black belt, Abu Dhabi champion, former junior college wrestler, the whole bit. Uh, and he's coming to take on Fabiano Scherner, who's a former UFC fighter, but this is what he does. Fabiano has 400 submission matches. He's only lost five of them, and that spans over his entire life since he was eight years old. Uh, that's the one that fans are really looking to. And then we've got Jake Shields and, uh, and Chris Lytle. That would probably round out uh, you know, some of the bigger bigger matches on the card. And we st- and we still got TJ DeSantis and yourself on the uh, the broadcast and uh, the voice of the Octagon, Bruce Buffer. He's still in the mix. That's right. So Bruce Buffer, here's a great story. Uh, Nate Quarter will also be joining us. Bruce Buffer coming out. He's been promoting. He's been having a great time. He was just in a lip sync contest for fun. In fact, he wasn't even doing the lip sync. He was emceeing it. He fell. And this is on TV. If you saw the clip, I don't mean I'm not by any means teasing him. I'm telling you what happened. He fell and he tore his ACL. So old Bruce isn't going to be doing anything for a little while. That that just happened. Yeah, I think I saw. I think Front Row Brian tweeted it out. He goes, "Oh man, I hope he's not hurt." Like, I mean, it wasn't. Uh, it was definitely a, a shoot. So it was like, uh, "Oh man, I really hope he's uh, hope he's okay." So, all right. And when I saw that, Jason, when I saw Brian's tweet, I saw it and laughed as oh, he of course he's not hurt. And then, I, and then the very next day, Bruce calls me. Goes, "Chill, I fell last night. I'm hurt and I won't be there." I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" I saw. I said, "Bruce, I saw the clip. I had no idea." He said, "Yeah, I tore my ACL." So there we are. 
All right. Well, that's the recap on uh, the Submission Underground again on Flow Combat, July 17th out of Portland. Now, now, Chael, if they're in the Portland area, if they're in the greater West Lynn market, how can they show up and check this thing out? Uh, it'll be at the Roseland Theater. Uh, Jason, it's completely sold out. It's been sold out for weeks. I've never, uh, I'm not aware of any grappling event that's ever sold out aside from the NCAA tournament. I'm not aware, aware of a grappling tournament that's ever sold out. I am certain no wrestling event, no grappling event has sold out two weeks early. So, and these tickets weren't cheap, man. It's not a cheap house. The the, the ticket seat was, uh, cheapest seat was 50 bucks. They are gone. So, when, I, when you hear the excitement in my voice, that's one little teeny tiny small market. Uh, Portland is not a hotbed for this kind of stuff. But when you're bringing in this kind of action, you bring in these kind of names. And, and frankly, because it's a first off, we do get a little extra attention. Uh, but that's it. The only way to watch is flowcombat.com. All right, a couple things we want to touch on now. Right before this episode uh, was recorded, you were on Joe Rogan show, the Joe Rogan Experience. And before that, you went with your uh, what's becoming an annual thing on your podcast, You're Welcome, with the uh, the Jim Rome Smack Off. I went through, and I listened to two and a half hours of this. And granted, I used the Overcast app for my iOS. So I had it on one and a half, two times speed. So I didn't have to get there you know, for two and a half hours listening to this. But it probably, it, it was a good chunk of my evening. And you got hosed, man. So the, you were the eighth best, according to Jim Rome. I think this whole thing was was. I'm going to borrow a lot of the terms that FRB likes to use in the, in the professional wrestling community. This was this seemed like a work here. Uh, this was this was this was almost. It seemed like it was planned. You got hosed here, but why don't you just give those who are wondering what the heck I'm talking about the uh, the smack off with Jim Rome, popular radio show. You even brought in Stone Cold Steve Austin to give you a boost, and that didn't work. I tell you, I really thought that eighth was a little low. I knew I didn't win it. Left, left one fair and square. I thought I'm looking at second and definitely not lower than third. And, and I, I just thought that was a fair assessment. I stand by it. But so the Rome smack off, just to, to update, if you got a new listener, Jim Rome is the biggest sports show in America and has been for a long time. He has something each year called a smack off where you call up, you get three minutes and you talk smack. You talk about other listeners, world events, anything you want, you go off. Uh, you got a three minute window, uh, a time limit, which you're not completely held to, but you get the point. And, uh, and that's it. And then, and then he grades it. There's a system. And now over the years, he's given out prizes and all sorts of stuff. This year, I think he gave out 5,000 in cash. Uh, it turns into a competitive thing and it's only once a year. Um, so there's some benefits that come with it. Anyway, it's legit competition. And I, I called in. I was ready. I take it serious. And uh, I didn't come hard enough. That's, that's what his assessment was. I thought I didn't come hard enough. Some other guys did. And I, I, I fell from, from one to eight. Yeah, I thought I thought last year's effort, to be quite honest with you, was a little bit better. I thought bringing in Stone Cold was a nice touch, but just something about last year because to me, listening to it last year was so new. It was like, dude, this is great because it was kind of like one of these things. Like, all right, let's do this. It, what you didn't have the the preparation like you did this year. Now you had a whole year to try to set this thing up. But I was just like, last year, man, you had me. I listened to that episode like three or four times just because. I mean, I'm not yeah, a huge, it, it, I'm not a huge Jim Rome fan, but the the whole just that whole atmosphere. I'm like, Ooh, I am hooked in on this. So once this came and out again, I'm like, yes, you know, it even surprises Rome. How crazy this thing got Rome. Rome can't even believe the things, you know, let, I'll go back to last year, but this guy left who won it this year, left flew a helicopter. He did his call from a helicopter, which is really easy to say. And then all of a sudden he tells Rome to look out the window. He's hovering outside of Rome's studio. And, uh, the FFA contacted him and, and told him he needed to move. And that that's official. That's on the record. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it gets pretty crazy. I mean, that's just one example, but yeah, it gets pretty crazy where guys are trying to win. It's, it's a hard competition. As silly as that might sound, it's not, it's, it's, it's hard. Now, moving to a couple other things, we'll get into the, the fight world. We just had UFC 200, the, the big letdown for people. There was no Johnny bones, no DC, uh, no Jones Cormier fight. Uh, you know, and, and you had talked about this on Joe Rogan's show. Uh, if you guys want to go back and listen to it, Joe Rogan Experience, I believe you were. It was like episode eight hundred and twenty something, and you talked about when you know why 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 is Daniel Cormier booed be, despite the fact that he's one of the nicest people on the planet? Uh, and, and you had made the uh, 
comparison that John Jones is like, I've been clean three months, gets a standing ovation. You know, Daniel Cormier says he's been clean for 36 years and people boo him. Why do people boo a guy like Daniel Cormier? That's what I can't, I can't fathom. Yeah. So you got, you got the good guys and you got the bad guys. Daniel Cormier is a great guy. He, he is so, so, so much the good guy, but he wants to be liked. Okay. It's one of the reasons that he treats people well and he has been a good guy his whole life. He wants to be liked, and anytime the fans sense that that's what you want, they are not going to give it to you. They have to find that conclusion on their own, or fans will take the exact opposite reaction. And I know that it's weird, but that's the way that it happens. John Jones has been hated his entire career because he's a scumbag that was trying to come off as a good guy. When he finally got caught against his will for being a scumbag, the fans loved it. Uh, they just did. So now, anytime you have a likable heel, so you've got a dirtbag like Jones that has a, a wonderful level of success, people get behind him, and it's always been that way. It just has. Daniel goes out. He tries to explain himself to the crowd. He tries to win them over. He's even said as much to say, why are you guys booing? Well, if you ask him that, you're, you've lost them. And so Daniel doesn't get the psychology. He's way off. It, I don't think it matters. He just made $3.2 million. I don't think he should give a damn, but for some reason, he does. And when the fans know that, they're not going to give you what you want. Moving on, Brock Lesnar coming back from the world of professional wrestling comes in. Unanimous victory over Mark Hunt. And this was one of these things if you don't know what you were going to get with Brock. Uh, people were kind of surprised he was rocking a Canadian flag. You know, people, yeah, he lives in Saskatchewan now, which is, no, oh, good for him. I mean, it's it's mountainous. I mean, not mountainous. It's very wilderness. Good place to, to get away from things. But, uh, you know, if Brock wants to come back anytime he wants, can he win every fight that he wants to come back and compete in? Uh, you know, I couldn't believe he won this one. You know, Brock's terrible. He is still <laughs> stuck. Um, and they sucked in wrestling, too. Now, his outcomes are phenomenal. And truly, Jason, the only thing that matters is the outcome when, when you're in sports. He is the most effective athlete that doesn't have a lot of skills that I've seen. He's a good competitor. Uh, He warms up properly. He he knows how to show up right. He understands uh, rounds. He understands point systems. He doesn't beat himself. So many times athletes go out, they do stuff, they sabotage. So we see it wrestling all the time. Guy doesn't need to score. He goes for a throw, puts himself straight on his back, either gives up the points or gets pinned while ahead. We see it all the time, and Brock will never do that. He'll he'll choose his moves wisely, high percentage technique, holds good position. He's strong enough that his opponents can't move him out of position. And even though his skills are amateur at best, uh, there's not a lot of guys that can beat him at anything. At anything he's got involved in, there's not many guys that can do it better. What's this do for for the draw now with the UFC going under this four billion dollars sale? You know, back and forth between the WWE with the you know the whole McMahon faction. You know, positive, negative, whether or not they wanted him to compete in this thing. I mean, he's kind, he's now that crossover combat athlete where he's got he can beat people up for real, and then he can put on a show. You know, a couple times a year with the big events and, and pay per views and things like that. So, how do you think that this relationship between the WWE and the UFC is going to have to exist with a guy like Lesnar? Well, you know, if, if this is a one-off and Brock's never coming back, but with that said, you know, a guy can be never coming back and that could be a hundred percent shoot. And then an hour later, he can change his mind. An hour later, a, a new idea comes up. Dana jumps on the phone with Vince or vice versa. And all of a sudden Lesnar's back. Now Lesnar, I thought was very candid. I, I, I was uh, very supportive of Brock, uh, not just because of the wrestling back out, but because I got what he was doing. He said, look, my career ended in a way I didn't want it to. And it wasn't because I lost. It it was because I wasn't able to perform. I had diverticulitis, which is the disease he was dealing with. And he said, you know, that's what beat me. And I just, I just want to be able to perform. And then whatever the outcome is, the outcome is, but I've got to go out the right way. That's why I'm doing this one more time. I really believe him. I really, now of course that came with a huge check, uh, but I believe it. I believe that that's what he was doing. So when he did get that success and he got his hand raised, very rarely, especially in this sport, does a guy get to go out on top. Guy get to go out on his terms, his way. Brock is now in that position. And so I, you know, not only do I think Brock won't be back, not only was I stunned that he even came back, I kind of hope we don't see Brock again. 
there is an allure and attraction. He's, he's a once in a lifetime uh, attraction. That's true, but he's also a guy that can now ride off and never look back, and that's a pretty cool thing. All right, moving gears. The last thing I want to touch on, uh, as far as the fight game talks to uh, talking about, is uh, the ultimate fighter, the winner uh, on the women's side, Tatiana Padilla Suarez, past women's world bronze medalist. This is the girl that kept. Helen Marulis off a couple world teams. I mean, we we talked about the wrestling acumen with her. Really strong season, the ultimate fighter. And with the women's division uh, still trying to gain some momentum right now, Ronda's not on top. We just saw Misha Tate lose in terms of the the depth of the entire women's division, every weight class and whatnot. Where do you think Tatiana's going to fit in here? And obviously with the the wrestling background, a a world medal, where do you think the ceiling is for her? And and how much do you think she can improve the, the scene of women's MMA? Yeah, so she's a high-level wrestler. We haven't seen a lot of those come over uh, to NMA. Sarah McMahon comes to mind. In fairness, uh, she was removed a long time. You know, Sarah hadn't wrestled in a very, very long time, and she's got a great career and will have a great one. But to have somebody like this that's that's a little newer on the scene, it's really hard to imagine that she gets beat. And those wrestling skills are helpful. They're not great. Wrestling moves aren't great anymore in MMA. But the wrestling mindset, the attitude, the grind, the grit, the determination, the ability to compete anyone, anytime, anywhere, that's the difference. That's what sets wrestlers apart from everybody else. That's why people say how tough wrestlers are. It isn't because we've got some kind of moves, some kind of skill set. It's because we don't look at contracts and negotiate. We show up to tournaments and take on anyone else that showed up. It could be four or five people in a day. You're looking at Fargo right around the corner. These guys are going to, you could beat 11 people in Fargo and not place. That's happened before you, you you get nine, 10 matches in. Now you can all of a sudden start looking, Hey, are there eight guys left? And you're going to do that in two different styles over the course of a week for most athletes. So uh, it's that wrestling mindset and ability and and history and toughness and work ethic. uh, That's going to make her very, very hard to catch going to finish up with some actual wrestling discussion. Uh, your college coach, uh, Ron Finley, passed away after a, a, a battle with cancer and uh, a guy who was uh, basically a real steward of the sport, Olympic coach, Olympic athlete, uh, really had uh, the University of Oregon's program nationally relevant uh, in his days as a coach. And, you know, just in the time we got left talking about Coach Finn, I know Kevin Roberts has always shared great stories about Coach Finn, but uh, what, what did the sport of wrestling lose with, with, with Ron Finley's passing? Coach Finn was the best. Coach Finn was just, you know, a wrestling coach, the great one. Uh, it's not about the techniques. It's not about the training and all of those things. The great college coaches are father figures, absolutely father figures. And the guys can look up to him. When he calls the 7 a.m. workout, the guys show up. It's a respect factor. When he tells you, hey, don't go out and go to bed, when he tells you to get up off the bottom or keep the other guy down, it's a respect factor. That's why you do it. Uh, and Finn was one of those guys. You know, he was a father figure. He had extreme integrity. He would never let you down. You're never going to grab a paper and read it someday and, and read something uh, bad that, that, that Coach Finn did in his spare time. It's just not how he worked. He put on great camps, uh, he ran a very professional program. Um, if he had a recruit in and he told him something, that was it. And he had that reputation and he earned it over the years. And, and again, you know, when it came down to integrity, he never faltered ever. And as far as what wrestling loses, not only do we lose a, a great member, but he was the absolute driving force, the founder, the president, the everything of the Save Oregon wrestling movement. Oregon lost its program. Uh, years after Finn retired, had Finn not retired, wrestling would still be in there today. But he did retire. They lost their program, and he worked tirelessly to get it back. And it was a moving target. First, they told him, that, hey, if you come to us with $2 million, we'll reinstate. He came to them with $2.8 million, and they said, well, now we need four. So he came up with four. They said, now we need six. Uh, the, the department continually uh, misled at best and lied to him at worst, uh, or he, or he would have had that before, before he passed too. Troy Steiner, new coach at Fresno state, Manny Rivera, new coach at CSU Bakersfield, John Saritas, new coach at Cal Poly West coast wrestling, three new coaches in California. Uh, you know, the Oregon state coaching staff shaking up a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts about these three hires in California specifically? 
Those are all great hires. Bakersfield's always going to have their work cut out for them. They just are recruiting wise. It's it's it, it's a hard thing, but historically, the guys that go there are all tough. I mean, Bakersfield, has, they're just known. They're just known for their toughness. They're good old boys that go out to that part of the state uh, and do real well. Steiner is not even a not even an if or a maybe. He is an absolute guaranteed. He will bring that program back. He will turn that around. He will have the, the best coaches. He'll run it professionally. He'll have a club program within a year. Uh, he'll have money. He'll have guys around. Steiner really believes in creating an environment in front of everything else. Create an environment for success, and then the success will come. Uh, I can't wait to see the moves he does. And, and Cal Poly, listen, that's the program. You know, If you ever visit that campus, I don't know how they don't sign every recruit that comes out there. It's the most beautiful campus in America. It's more beautiful than Arizona State, yeah, you know, because it, it, it also has the benefit of the ocean. Uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens there, but Cal Poly is one of those that have never taken off. Mark Perry was the youngest NCAA coach in the nation, and not just for wrestling. There was no coach of any sport that was the head of a, of a Division One team that was 26 years old, and he left. And that really surprised me, but Cal Poly has just always kind of had struggles there, and I don't know why. They've got the funding. They've got a great coach in place right now. They've got kids that want to come there, uh, but they've got to put the, the, all those pieces together, or they're going to be in the hot seat themselves. All right, Joe, last time you were on, we didn't have a chance to roll through the short-time questions. Ten questions, 90 seconds. First thing that comes to your mind. You ready to roll? Ready. All right, best match you've ever watched? Uh, Schultz-Vanek, 1982. Tonight you win the Olympic gold. What's for dinner? Steak, medium rare, just the way I like it. Who's the best wrestler people don't talk about? Uh, the best wrestler people don't... Well, I'll tell you the guy that didn't get his due was Eric Guerrero. Eric Guerrero was a three-time NCAA champion, four-time placer who did not redshirt he just happened to be competing at the exact same years as a young man named Kale Sanderson, uh, who got a, all of the spotlight. Uh, Eric Guerrero is uh, is probably one of the, the more unsung talents that we've had. All-time favorite flavor of Gatorade? Blue, and I don't know what it's called. Your best roommate ever? Oh, geez, has to be Kevin Keeney. Favorite international wrestler outside of yourself? Favorite international wrestler is uh, Batirov, the younger one, and uh, two-time Olympic champion at two different weight classes. Uh, beat Steven Abbott, as a matter of fact, for the gold, uh, Batirov. All right, you win the Powerball. What's the first college wrestling program you're starting? Well, I would it would have to be Oregon Wrestling. They've got plenty of money out there, but apparently they're still open to a bribe, and I like people to do this that way. So I would be down in Eugene within two hours. Best JV guy on your high school team? <sighs> wow. Um, that's a fun question. A lot of guys were JV, ended up on Olympic teams. I remember, not, well, this wasn't my high school, but uh, I remember Sh uh, Schwab and Zadek. Neither one of them. Uh, was the starter for all four years at Iowa because they traded places back and forth. And in 2008, they ended up uh, teammates for the Olympics. Um, in my school, the best JV wrestler, uh, Greg Johnson. Favorite restaurant on the planet? Oh, for my favorite restaurant, Mr. Chow's in California. All right, and uh, the question, this question we actually created when we had uh, Ray Brinzer on the show, and it's it's taken a, a different life of its own. What is your spirit animal? My spirit animal would be a dog. Simply a dog. Simply a dog, and maybe even a cat, but I'll go with dog. All right, Chael, you're out of uh, you're out of the short time. Thanks for the time, and we look forward to Submission Underground, July seventeenth, live on Flow Combat. Can, can you and I agree, though, as we roll into Fargo, can we agree on this? If you don't go to Fargo, you are not the best wrestler in the country. Whoever wins Fargo is the national champion because every now and then we'll have guys that don't show up for whatever reason, and then they want us all to concede that they, they could have won it anyway. Well, 
there's a big difference in could have won it and did win it. The guys that pack up, that go to camp, that go to Fargo, that put it on the line, that take on 11 guys in two days, whoever comes out of there with the stop sign is the national champ. Can we agree on that? I agree. One thing I did have to correct you on those. Now, you know, they're no longer doing the vertical pairing. They're in a straight line bracket now. So no, gone are the days where you can go eight rounds, go eight, no, and then lose your next two and not play. So now you're looking at uh, a much, uh, you probably winning seven to win this thing. And the only way somebody is finishing undefeated, you know, you, you, you get one loss in this tournament now, you're not going to win it. So they take away that, that, you know, that first round, loss that J.D. Bergman did, so many other people have done it, and go through and end up winning the bracket with a pool system, but now it's a straight bracket. Marketing-wise, we've got quarters, we got semis, we got a blood round, so uh, that changed uh, two, three years ago, so no longer do we have those monster square, you know, tic-tac-toe on crack brackets, but uh, I agree with you, that is the toughest tournament uh, in this country, and then, you know, at least you've got to at least win it. I mean, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything wrong with a senior who's already done well there, kind of skipping it, and okay, getting ready for college, but... Uh, yeah, this this is the big dog, the stop sign. This is the stop sign. This isn't like, you know, uh, I can enter the veterans next year at 37 and get myself a stop sign because I entered and there was nobody in it. This is the real stop sign. This is the original. I agree. I'm glad we're on the same page. Have fun out there. I got an email from your scheduling guy that said 9 a.m. Pacific. 9.30, just like you and I talked about. Uh, this might end up on the end of the po- This might end up on the post show. This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.